Well, hello, good morning. Everyone can hear me? Please raise your hand if you can understand what I'm saying. Okay, good. It's a good start. All right. So today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, Feature 7, which, in my opinion, is absolutely awesome. And it's a really awesome job that the guys from the PHP team and the Zend company team uh, have put a lot of effort into this. And uh, yeah, I think it's a fantastic job. And I wanted to, sh to show you today uh, some strategies on migrating systems, and specifically with migrating systems for PHP 7. At the moment, who's using PHP 7 in their job with um, production? So not that many. Okay, so who's using PHP 5 right now in their job? Pretty much everybody, okay. So everybody hopefully will get some kind of value from this talk today. Um, very quick introduction. That's me on Twitter. So if you want to take any pictures or whatnot, that would be, that would be awesome. And uh, yeah, take some pics. These are a few things I'm involved in. I contribute to PHP, uh, the, the new PHP website. It used to be really old and busted, and now it's the new hotness, as of a few years ago. And I do things on PHP Fig. PPI Framework is a project that I work on, and I organize a conference in uh, Scotland, where I'm from. So there, this is Scotland. Uh, you may, may notice I'm not, I'm not, I don't really sound English, although I'm from the UK. Uh, so this is a picture of Scotland. Very typical, and yeah, some more, some more kind of random, random pics. And uh, this is a picture of me. My three, ch three children. Uh, my oldest son, his name is Kyle. He wrote his first PHP script uh, two weeks ago. He's five. So, nice one, Kyle. There's a, there's a, I think there's a camera there. So, um, yeah. So PHP, right? PHP's given me getting a lot of uh, what's the word? Stiff competition, I would say, from other languages. New la languages coming up, languages disappearing, languages uh, getting better, faster, and slower. And PHP has been getting a lot of uh, you know criticism from one way or the other, whether it's speed, whether it's usability, right? And also, this is a quite a picture that sums things up, right? So there's Python. People are like, oh yeah, but Python's faster than PHP, so you should use that. Uh, Ruby's got you know you can bootstrap things a bit faster than Ruby, so yeah. But PHP seven. In my opinion, completely blows this away. So you got another one, Pokemon, right? So uh, this is a, a from the from what, from the internet. Well, I haven't. Can we put that down a little? Maybe. Can we put the lights down a little bit? Awesome. Thank you. Um, Okay, so yeah, PHP 7, right? Awesome speed performance, and this is WordPress. This, for me, sum, sums up everything you need to know. Of course, this is only one example. It's Mandelbrot Fractal, which is just an algorithm, some kind of thing. Doesn't really matter. The point is that PHP 7 completely blows all the other languages out of the water in this specific case, right? So I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty excited. I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited to, to be here today and to share some experiences and to hopefully get everyone as quick as possible onto PHP 7. So, this is a quick summary. What I try to do, try to summarize what the talk will consist of into main sections. So we're going to look at what will break, what potentially can break uh, when you do upgrade, or if you do upgrade. Um, how to identify and check the compatibility of your existing systems, and to is it compatible with PHP 7, and also identifying what needs to change in order to get there. Um, also benchmarking and monitoring, and that's pretty important. And we'll see why once we go into the talk in more detail. Once you've got actually PHP 7 ready codes, but the important part is about packaging that up properly and being able to distribute that around and deploying that onto systems that are maybe you currently have live traffic uh, on your production systems, and you don't want to disrupt that by potentially uh, upgrading PHP to 7. So it's about um, deploying things correctly from a code, code perspective and maybe from a, a database perspective. So these are a few things. Um, there is a, basically all the details you, should, you need to know are on the php.net website. And this is just a screenshot. So if you just Google for migration 7.0 or whatnot, it's, it's there. So that everything else I'm summarizing today. But yeah, you, everything you need to know should be there. So, 
One of the most important changes in PHP 7 is behavior. <laughs> some features were added, some things were taken away. But the most important thing that's hard to um, actually deal with is behavior. And if behavior changes, that's not something you can just easily identify, usually. And for, but fortunately, we can detect this. And I'll show you how. So PHP 7, we added something called an abstract syntax tree. Um, ignoring the underlying details, basically what that means is we figured we put a, 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 an intermediate layer between the PHP code that you write and the engine that actually parses it, allowing us to inspect at a very in-depth detail what your code is doing, how it's performing, what the data types are, what variables are doing. That's what the abstract and syntax tree, what's the benefit that it gives us. But by doing so, we inverted the logic of how variables are interpreted by the AST and by the engine. And that's why I'm highlighting this to you today. So this is an example. All right. So looking at the, ignoring the first line, but if you go to the second line, you'll see that on the old behavior, it would evaluate the right side first with the brackets and then resolve that. And then whatever that becomes, like a string, then it would call that on foo. But now, in PHP 7, it evaluates the left side first. So whatever, for looking at the second example, whatever foo bar, foo dollar, dollar, foo dollar bar, becomes, then it will call baz on top of that. Understand? It takes a little time, maybe, to look at it for a while. Again, it's all on the website, so go look at it. It's, it is important to know. Um, we removed a few things, so your code will, uh, if you're using the dash e modifier and preg replace, which is eval, which is like, you know, the devil and you shouldn't use it. Um, we removed that, that's completely gone now. And the recommended practice is to use this callback system. So um, if you're using that already uh, in your systems, it's something to look out for. We also del deleted this, so if you're using, if you are unfortunate enough to be using a system that's using this variable, it's been deleted also, so that will break. Um, we also become, become more strict on uh, using octals, part of dealing with octal values. You can see here this, this becomes, in, five, in PHP 5, it becomes 375. And the reason is because the 8, uh, 8 is not a valid octal number because octal goes from 0 to 7, right? So 8 gets chopped off and then somehow that value is 375. In PHP 7, it actually says, oh, 8 is not a valid octal number, so we're just going to throw a new error, all right? So it's a good thing, but you need to be aware of it because if something was silently failing before, it's not going to silently fail any further. It will just throw an ex a parse error exception. And um, there's new reserve keywords, so if you have any, anything in your system that's using these types of things, classes, objects, vari uh, not variables, but, uh, you know, keywords, it will, these are reserved in the language, so you'll get a parse error. All right, and from a behavioral perspective, we added uh, throwables internally. So now it used to get like E underscore warning, E underscore uh, fatal, E underscore whatever. They're no longer errors anymore, they're exceptions. Everything now inherits from a throwable interface, uh, implements a throwable interface, and uh, we have this generic error now, right? And then you've got different types of errors. And the same with the exception, and then exception has different types. Okay? So, about compatibility. Is your code ready or is it not ready? How do we do this? So, there's a tool called Fan. Uh, so, Rasmus Lerdoff, the creator of PHP, he wrote this tool called Fan, PHP Analyzer. Raise your hand if you have seen, heard of this tool before. Fan? Okay. Some of you? This is awesome. And it uses this new feature called this new abstract syntax tree to inspect your code and identify this, the behavioral changes. You know all these things I identified before um, that have changed in PHP 7? This tool will tell you if your code is doing that. Right? Pretty awesome. It needs a PHP extension. So you don't, you cut, and it needs, it runs on PHP 7 because PHP 7 has an AST. So, you need a PHP 7 system, you need, a, you need to compile the AST, it needs to come with the AST extension, and then, um, then you can run FAN, which is just a PHP library. So to, in order to get a PHP 7 system, there's two very convenient ways. Rasmus Lerdoff, again, 
he created something, a vagrant uh, system called PHP 7 Dev, and it's a vagrant it's a vagrant image, and you just it's a virtual machine. You just pop in, and it has loads of different versions of PHP inside, so you can easily switch between them. So it's very convenient. Um, also, Docker. Uh, I won't go into too much detail today about Docker, but Docker is a very convenient way to switch and use different versions of PHP on demand without installing anything on your actual computer. So this is what I've got on my machine. This is a MacBook. It has PHP 5.5. But right now, I'm running Fan on all my code, which is using Docker. So this thing in the middle here is actually a Docker container. This Docker container I didn't create. I got it from the web. Inside this Docker container, it has PHP 7.0. It has the ASD extension compiled, and it has the Fan library built in. All right? And what I'm doing is I'm taking the code that's on my computer, like any directory, any project I have right now, I run a one command, it takes the code, it puts it into the container, runs the stuff, and then outputs a report for me. And the fan will tell you what is, uh, is not broken. All right? So I created this very, very small script on my computer, and it's just called fan docker. This is the docker command underneath. Basically, it takes the present working directory, which is where my project lives, where I currently am, and it puts it inside the container to a, a directory, mount source, and what happens is when this, this container here called by a company called Cloudflare, when it runs, it's going to execute a script called run fan. And I built this myself. And what, this is what it does. It's very basic. All right? Again, this is all from the fan documentation. It's really like, you know, one, fan 101. It's very simple. But I, uh, I, in my current directory, I don't just have PHP files. I have JavaScript. I have CSS. I have images. So I don't want fan to try and analyze all these things and take a long time. So I wrote this find thing to give me all PHP files recursively and file list. And then I just use the file list here. And uh, I do dash o to analysis.txt. So this is actually running inside the Docker container. All right? But what happens is because on the previous slide you see I've done this dash v, it's called a volume in Docker. What that means is it takes my code and puts it in the container. And if anything changes on my, com on my system, it will automatically update in the container and vice versa. Anything that happens in the container will happen on my computer. So inside the container, when I done dash o analysis.txt, it put that back onto my machine. Did that make sense at all? Raise your hand if you understood what I said there. Okay, good. Right, I try. Docker is very difficult to explain uh, if you've not heard of it before. So this is the over, overall picture. So I, I'll put my, this code on GitHub. My username is this is my surname is Tragunis on GitHub, uh, and you just run one command. Uh, this command here, and you and you can run fan on anything. You don't have to install anything on your machine, all right? And then you get PHP 7 and fan. Okay, and this is just some of the analysis.txt, just the output file. These are just some things it was coming up with on one of the projects I had. It's clearly clearly weird and uh, it's not P PHP 7 compatible, but it just gives you an example. Fan will throw out exceptions for all the things that are not PHP 7 compatible, all right? So. Once you get to the point where you're running fan and you are going around and you're fixing tweaks and you're tweaking things and you're fixing bugs in your code and you're making it PHP 7 compatible, when you get to the point where it is compatible and you can run a PHP 7 system, the important part is before you make any changes, put some monitoring in place, some benchmarking. All right. Now, there's two main factors. We can use Apache Bench or we can use JMeter. Who, has anybody here used Apache Bench? Okay. And what about JMeter? Okay. But a little bit less with JMeter there. So they are good, both different tools. I have a command here where I have a two Docker containers running on my machine. One's PHP 5.6 and one's PHP 7.0. And they're on different host names. All right. So I run Apache Bench. I, run, I send some traffic to my thing. And I tell it to output to this PHP 5.0 and PHP 7.0 files. All right. Now, this is useful. Because with these dot out files, we can put the dot out files into other pieces of software, and we can generate some graphs. So this is a this is a, a Linux tool called GNU Plot, and GNU Plot will uh, you see here down here is like PHP 7 dot out, so we can actually create graphs out of the dot out data on the fly. That's pretty awesome. Um, they are two completely independent tools, but they work very well together. And as a result, you know you just create your legends, your, your x-axis uh, x and your y-axis, and then 
you get something like this. This is just a PNG file, all right? This example, of course, is like Apache versus Nginx, but you can see the same difference if it was PHP 5 versus PHP 7, okay? So um, that's Apache Bench. JMeter is good, also has a GUI tool, so you can set up JMeter to send traffic to your sites to benchmark the speed difference. Because before you actually say, we sh should we or should we not move to PHP 7, you actually want to identify what the difference is, how much value is in actually switching. All right? So this is just, this is just JMeter, one of the, the interfaces, and you tell it, um, see that C, there's, a, there's a CSV file there, so that could be like a dot out file, whatever, but that's the results. So you just give JMeter a, a results file, and then it creates more awesome graphs, all right? So you can get more creative, more analysis, more results, and actually come up with, if, you're, if, you're, if this is in your job, and you're trying to pitch to, to your business, to the business, how much value they will get, this is where you want to start, right? Before I actually start moving over. Okay, also in addition to this, uh, if you're in development or a staging or testing or production environment, uh, you can set up ELK, uh, an El uh, also known as ELK stack. And basically your PHP app sends stuff to Logstash and then that forwards it onto Elasticsearch and it stays in there as a database. And then you have Kibana, which is a, user, a, a dashboard for visualizing uh, data, all right? Um, I wanted to quickly show this on my machine. So I have an Elk stack here. I'm using Docker Compose on my, on my laptop. I run this and I, I didn't install anything on my computer, but it's run, it's, spin, it's booting up Elasticsearch and Logstash, uh, the, yeah, in Kibana. And they're listening on some ports on my machine. And now I have another tool here, another tool that isn't running on Docker, called Weave Scope. Hopefully this works. Okay, so this is, this is actually a tool called Weave Scope. Weave Scope is actually a visualization tool for Docker, and it shows you all your containers, and it shows you the traffic between your containers. So I'm going to try and put up Weave again. If it works, it'll be awesome. If not, then fair enough. Live demos don't really work. Okay, so that's scope running. All right. There you go. So these are three Docker containers that I've spun up on my machine, and it shows you the the traffic between them. So if I had a PHP application, uh, like a, another Docker container, which is like a PHP 7 app, you would see that can pop up somewhere on here, and it would show you that it's speaking to Logstash. And then you, you see there's a line between these guys. That's because Logstash is connected via TCP to that. So this is an awesome visualization tool for Docker. You can run this on your local machine, which is what I'm doing right now. You can run this on uh, remote servers as well. So if you have, like, you're using Docker, uh, on AWS or other systems, it will remotely connect and you can see all the CPU and memory. This is free and you can download it on your machine. All right, so I just want to sh highlight that this tool is awesome also. Okay, so go back to the slides. But yeah, I, I didn't install anything on my machine, I just run one command and I had three different services running uh, and I had the visualization tool to show that. It's pretty awesome, right? So, this is Kibana, you can create graphs out of the data, does it for you, it's well documented on the internet, but you get more rich interfaces. So this is say you're on production right now and you want to start logging where, you, where your PHP 5 system is, the response times, every request, how long it takes. You want to set something up like this, so that when you do switch to PHP 7, you can compare. You can see if there's been a problem, you can roll back if there's a bug that you haven't really fixed yet. Okay, so, we have a, so far, part of this, this, this process, we have a PHP 7 app, right? I mean, we may have some benchmarking, we have some graphing, or we have some monitoring in place. How do we actually get a code from on our laptops to production? That's where continuous integration systems come in. At the moment, who's doing some form of continuous integration, as in like testing, using Jenkins, maybe? Bamboo or something like that? 
Okay? No, so see, yeah, continuous integration is really just automation around running your tests. All right? Any kind of test. It can be interface tests. It can be unit tests. It can be any type of test. It doesn't matter. As long as you have tests, that's a good start. All right? And there's pipeline tools for this. So you, what we do is we typically have continuous integration um, pipelines. So what that means is we have different series of steps in our pipelines that do certain tasks for us, to check our code. Every time we, we make a change and we push to our repositories, uh, it will trigger a series of jobs to analyze and identify our code. And there's Ant, which is a very popular one. And also there's a PHP one called Thing, which is very popular. Anybody here using Ant on Jenkins? What about Thing? Anyone using Thing? OK, so a few more hands for Thing. All right. So Jenkins has this thing called Job DSL, which I want to, to tell you about. So in Jenkins, you have to manually, with the interface, go and create jobs and put all, write down all the code and all the steps inside that. Jenkins has a job DSL, and this is what it looks like. So I have one job here called all tasks, or you want to have little, little, lots of little small jobs. This is awesome, right? Because no, you don't need an interface any longer to go around and click on Jenkins. You can write code, and it will, you can say what will happen. All right? What will happen? What order? And if, if it fails, then it will stop and you'll get a failure. All right? So this is job DSL, which is part of Jenkins. This is actually Groovy script, the language Groovy script. Um, but as you can see, it's very easy to use. So, continuous integration pipelines. This slide is about if you have a pipeline already that just runs tests or tries to, like, does the home page of my application load port 80 and does the home page load, does it, rather than getting a 500 error and it falls over? What I'm recommending is you, as a, for a strategy, is you do the same in parallel for PHP 7 and PHP 5. All right? Have them in parallel. Just because you're not switching today doesn't mean you will not want to switch to PHP 7 in the future, or the near or long term future. So run them in parallel. So every time you push to your branch, you get the results for PHP 5, which you care about today, but you also see for the future, have I broken something for PHP 7? All right? So this is kind of where I'm going with the rest of the talk, is you want to run them in parallel. This is called a migration strategy. Okay? It's called parallel running parallel pipelines. All right? So first step of your pipeline, so we have prepare, preparation of the environment, run some tests. If the tests are good and, and we, we say that our software is okay, we package up that code and then we deploy it somewhere. It could be a staging server or a testing server or a production server, right? If we're that brave. So the prepare step is usually something like this, right? We run some composer install and some unit tests. Again, you do the same in parallel. So if anything, PHP 7 breaks, uh, you'll know about it in the background, right? So just keep that in mind. Then we have tests. So usually the testing phase of our software looks something a little bit like this. Lots of different types of testing here, from unit testing to PHP spec to, to BHAT to codeception to interface testing with Mink, Selenium, all right? And then comes the packaging phase. So the packaging phase is very important. There's two methods of doing deployments. You can either tell a remote server just to pull down your code and update it. But the problem with that is if you pull down code on the testing server, run tests, and you see the code is good, and then you tell it again to pull down the code on a, on a remote server, there could have been a change, right? Say you're pulling from a branch. Say the branch is called version one. And you, on your testing server, go back one. On your testing server, you're testing branch one, right? And it's good. If you just connect into a remote server and just do git pull or subversion pull or whatever, someone could have pushed to that branch. And you don't, you were not, not, you've no way for you to know about that, right? So that's why doing pulling down code on, remote ser on the end server is not a good strategy. And that's why packaging is important. And there's lots of different um, tools to do packaging with. So we have the basic, which is actually one of the most stable, because it's the simplest, which is just really creating a zip of all your code, or a tar, or a gzip, or whatever you know, compression you have. And then you can rsync that to any server in the world that you have a connection to. All right? But the important thing is, is you're taking your code your, that you tested, and you know that this code is solid and it's, and it's really, really working really well, and you move that to any server. All right? That's really important. Other options we have, Artifactory, 
Artifactory is used more so in the Java world. Anybody here used Artifactory? Okay, a few hands. Artifactory is an awesome tool. Really, it's just a, it's just like a storage storage tool, and you just push things into it, and then you pull things down. You pull it on from whatever server you want. So it's just like a push-pull mechanism. Another another very solid option is that once you create a tar of your of your code or a zip of your code, you can use Amazon S3. Is anybody doing? Is anybody pushing any of their code to Amazon S3 right now? Okay, not that many. Amazon S3 is, is cheap, it's affordable, but the important thing is you only need to, if say you have 10 servers and you want to update your code on 10 servers, you don't have to push your code 10 times. You can push it to one central location, S3. Now let's say that your code is not just in one country or region. Let's say, you're, let's say your product is, uh, you have servers in uh, Singapore and some in Germany and some in the America, then taking pulling your code down from Amazon S3, which may be hosted in uh, like the United States, will cost you lots of money because you're taking it over regions, right? This is where you put a CDN in front of it, all right? The CDN, the, po the point of a CDN, uh, Content Delivery Network, is it detects where you are in the world and Amazon will just distribute the code to all, uh, your S3, your code, to all the, place, all the regions in the world, that makes sense. And then whatever server pulls that down, it will be the closest server to that. All right. So that's why you can also not just take advantage of CDNs for the users, like serving them images and stuff, but you can also do it for yourself. And that means it's faster and it's cheaper. All right. So that's a good point. Also, if you're using Docker, again, it's like it's like Artifactory. Docker is a Docker registry. It's a central location, and every time you you test code and you, you say this is good. Package it up. You do a Docker build. You build it up and you push it into a registry. And then on any any other server on on the internet, you just do the Docker pull and you pull it down. All right. So again, push pull mechanism very similar to Artifactory. GitLab is free. It's open source. It's an awesome tool. Also has a storage feature, just like Artifactory. So you don't need to pay money for S3 because GitLab has a built-in. So something you, something you can think about as well. Anybody here using GitLab? Yeah, lots of hands, awesome. So, once we have code and we've packaged it and we've chosen the toolkits we like and we've chosen you know, what makes sense for us, um, this is more a picture of, more of a, a more solid pipeline. All right? I give a Git repo over here, a developer does a push, he pushes code, and then it, it executes tasks. All right, you do your tasks, like I was saying, whatever tests make sense for you, and then you run jobs. There's a job, and it's doing lots of jobs, and it's testing your code and inspecting it, running fan, running PHP unit, running uh, bhat or whatever, and then it will package up your code, and this is where your artifacts go. So you create an artifacts here, and then you just take your artifacts and put them in this little box, and then you just put them to any server you like. Once the artifact is there, it has a unique name, you can put it anywhere you like. All right? You don't need to do, start doing get pulls on all different servers and have doing all sorts. Package it up, and then it's a redistributable thing that you know you've tested and it's solid. All right? And then you can go put it on a QA server for testing or staging for uh, security testing, right? for example, before you do production. All right? So deployment. Now that you have your code and it's packaged up, and you're happy with it, and you want to start pulling it down. You can uh, you can use Ansible, which is a really good tool. It's not the greatest tool, but it is it is pretty good. Um, Ansible, you can have a list of servers that you want to manage, and you say, okay, run this command on all these servers, and it can use this rsync, so it can connect to a central storage server that you have running a hard drive on the internet somewhere, and it can just start rsyncing and pulling down your tar, your tar file and unpacking it. So that's a good strategy. Also, we can use RPMs or dev files, which is also very solid. So you can do apt-get update or apt-get install or uh, yum, for example, on CentOS. And yeah, so this is also a very, a very solid way to package up your code and put it into versioning systems. So rather than just having tar balls flying around, you can actually create RPMs out of your code. All right. Pull from Artifactory, pull from Amazon S3 directly, or you can pull from the CDN. Again, I was saying it's probably cheaper and faster. 
um, Docker registry and GitLab storage. Um, here's some more tools for using. Capistrano is a good tool. Has some has some drawbacks, but has anybody here used Capistrano? More hands. Awesome. There's also something called Webistrano, which is an interface allows you to see history and manage your deployments. So I recommend you check that out. If you're using Capistrano right now, go check out Webistrano. It's, it's built on Ruby and Rails again, but it's a pretty awesome tool. Also, we have Kubernetes. Kubernetes is an awesome tool. It's, it uses Docker underneath, but it's an orchestration platform built by Google that they donated to the Linux, the Linux Foundation, like the open source community-driven Linux Foundation. And now the guys are taking it on. So Kubernetes is, is absolutely awesome and has a lot of features, re very, very good features. Also, in comparison to Kubernetes, you have Docker Swarm. Docker Swarm is how you manage your code. So you have a Docker image, you package it, you put it in the registry, and you say, I want these, these 1,000 servers to have the copy of this code, and Docker Swarm will do it for you. So will Kubernetes. They do things differently, but it's the same. There's another awesome tool called SaltStack. Anybody heard or just even just heard of SaltStack before? Okay. Who's heard of Puppet or Chef? More hands. Okay. This is better than them, and it blows that Ansible out of the water. All right. So I recommend you check SaltStack out. Ansible is not very good because you need port 22 open, you need SSH, you need a login. All right. Ansible just uses SSH keys to, to log into the servers as you, and then start running commands on them. Salt Ansible at SaltStack doesn't even use port 22, so you can just like stop, don't even have that port open, so it's more secure. Has little they're called agents, and little, little agents they sit on all your servers, and they have a central SaltStack server called a, I think it's called a reactor or something like that or a master, and it communicates in real time with all the agents and all your servers, and it knows what's happening, and knows if they're under lots of RAM or or whatnot. It's really awesome technology. So I do recommend you check it Salt Stack. If you're using Chef or Puppet or Ansible, go and check it Salt Stack. Also, it's YAML syntax. So it's, it's as powerful as Chef and Puppet, but you don't need to write uh, like Ruby code. You can use YAML. So it's powerful like YAML, like Ansible is, but it has all the awesome features. Okay, so I want to highlight some, some uh, Salt Stack there. So there's two types of deployment strategies I want to, I want to highlight today. We have blue green deployments and rolling update deployments. So this is basically you have PHP 5 running right now on production, and you already have PHP 7 code that you've packaged, and you want to update your servers, but you don't want to you want zero downtime, right? I'm, I'm talking like milliseconds, like you don't have to bring any servers down and then bring up PHP 7 systems, like literally no downtime. Okay, Who's, who here has heard of blue green deployments? Okay. This is blue-green deployments, all right? Blue-green deployments is, this is a central, like a load balancer, all right? And the, the blue one is PHP 5. It's in production, it's working, okay? What happens is we get green, and green is like the new guy, all right? And what we do is we put green into production, and internally, or under the hood, we're not, we're not sending, so there's a load balancer, right? And the load balancer is sending traffic to all your blue, all your blue servers. All right. What we do is we put green ones in there, and we test them. We put health checks in them to make sure that you can ping them. They respond to you know HTTP 200 OK. The home page is loading. Also, we can be a bit more uh, in depth and use smoke tests. So smoke tests are who's head of smoke tests? Okay. Smoke tests are basically tests that don't like, it pretends to be a user, but it doesn't do anything important. It's, can I go to the home page? Can I click on the navigation? Can I log in? Can I update my profile? But it's not going to be doing things like, can I buy e-commerce items? Can I go to the shopping? Can I, can I buy things, right? That's going to like do real money things because it's a real production server. So what you can do under the hood is, this new PHP 7 environment that I've loaded, I can do more tests and make sure it's working. And what happens is once it passes smoke tests, then it flips a switch like that, all right? So the blue becomes the green, and the green becomes the blue. And then what happens is you have monitoring in place with that elk stack, the Elasticsearch 
logs dash Kibana, and you monitor that. And if the green one is good, that's fine. But all of a sudden, if the new environment, PHP 7 environment, is actually causing problems, you're getting errors, you're getting exceptions in your logs, you can flip the switch back. You see? So that's why we have group blue and green. All right? You put the new guy and you have the guy on backup. He's on standby. And then you just flip the switch back and the load balancer will stop sending traffic to the old guy and it'll switch it. Does that make sense? Yeah? So that's blue-green deployments. Now we have rolling update deployments. This is how you get zero downtime. Because when you flip that switch with the blue-green deployments, there is a problem that could happen. You're literally taking everything from the old and switching everything to the new. So it's more risky, right? Rolling update deployments is something that's built into Kubernetes, right? Or um, who, who's here using AWS, Amazon Web Services? Okay, keep, keep your hands up if you're using uh, uh, Elastic Beanstalk. Okay, under the hood, Elastic, Elastic Beanstalk is a system that is a low, has a load balancer and it has all your servers underneath and it manages that. And if you push updates to one of the servers, it does this rolling update system under the hood. So rolling update is this. What it does is say you've got three servers running in production right now. What it will do is, this is a load balancer, okay? And right, it, see, it's sending the traffic to all three of your servers because they're all PHP 5. But when you say, rolling, do a rolling update with PHP 7, it will take the, blue, the middle one and it will take it out of the load balancer. It will say, I am no longer giving you traffic because I'm going to perform a rolling update on you. It will upgrade PHP 7. It will put PHP 7, it will, it will you know, the, pull down your package, your code, and put it on there. Then you can run some health checks, you can run some smoke tests, you can do whatever you like. There's no more pressure, all right? You can, you can say when you're ready. And then when you say I'm ready, it puts it into the load balancer. And he's getting PHP 7 traffic. And then it moves to the next guy and does the same. So then you'll have one PHP 7, and then if you do the same, it'll have two PHP 7s, but you still get the PHP 5. And if any of these fail their health checks, you can, you can flip the switch back, all right? So things like Kubernetes, Amazon Web Services, they do this for you by default. But you can roll your own. There's lots of tools to do this. Um, yeah, so that is rolling updates. And they're more, more safe, I think. Because if the PHP 7 ones start failing, at least you still have PHP 5 ones still there serving traffic. And you know, it's not like a flipping a switch and everything's there. Does that make sense? All right, so that's two by two, two deployment strategies. Next, and finally, so if you have any questions, um, this is the last, probably the last slide. So if you have any questions, I think there's microphones, so feel free to, to stand up and go to the mics. This is something called, this is a tool called Ghost, and GitHub built this. Has anybody heard of this? It's G-H, is there a name here? No, it's G-H-O-S-T. Has anybody heard of this before? Okay, this is awesome, all right? GitHub just announced this, open sourced it, like last month. They use it in GitHub to do migrations in all your repositories with zero downtime. And how do they do it? It's absolutely awesome. Say you have a, say you have a, migra a database migration and on a production server and it's going to take one hour to execute or it's going to slow down it's going to slow down your queries because you're like deleting columns or you're you know, removing data or you're adding data, right? What Ghost does, it uses replication. And it's for MySQL, by the way. It's so smart. It uses replication. So this is your current server in, in production. This is where your customers or your users are actually getting the data from. It creates a Ghost table. Actually, it just does a, it creates a master-slave relationship. And this is called the Ghost table. The ghost table is here. It's a replica. And MySQL keeps masters and all the slaves in synchronous by using binary logs, right? So it uses the binary log to update. So, so what it does is it clones your current database, creates a slave out of that, and then runs the migration on the slave. And it will do that, and it will stay there forever until your migration is finished. And then when your migration is finished and the binary log is synchronized, so the slave is fully synchronized with the master, it will flip them back round. So therefore, your migration, this, the thing you're doing your migration on, it's doing it in the background with zero downtime. And then 
when MySQL, uh, when Ghost says, okay, the Ghost table is now the most up-to-date one, it will flip the switch and then the master will become, it will go away and the new replica will become the master. Does that make sense? This is awesome technology and it's really good and that's what GitHub have been using this whole time and they've just open sourced it. So I do recommend uh, you check that out as well. Um, I'll just quickly go to uh, the internet in a sec. But uh, yeah, I think we're done. Hopefully you got some value from that. The slides will be online, so uh, check Twitter. I'll put the link up and all the things I mentioned, all the tools and technologies um, will be there. So I hope you got some, I hope someone, some of you got something from that. And yeah, thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Paul. Um, hi, everyone. I don't know if, uh, you, if all of you have been here yesterday, but I'm Sherry. I'm your MC for today. Um, does anyone have any questions for Paul? You can just speak out loud. I probably hear you. Yeah. <laughs> or you can meet him during lunch and ask him all the questions you have. Hi. Mm -hmm. No. It's your, so the question was, Amazon S3, uh, is it just for static files like images and stuff, or can you put, serve PHP files from there? You can't serve PHP files from there because it's just, it just gives you what you ask it for, so it's just like a CSS file, right? You need a web server to actually change that. But Exactly. You need a server. With a, you, need, you need Nginx or FPM or Apache to actually take the PHP and run the PHP engine and give you back whatever you want. The example with S3 was you, you take your code and you, you, you create a zip file or something and then you put it on S3 and, then, and then, then from any place in the world you can just pull that as long as you have the correct permissions or use the CDN in front of it, which I was saying. Yeah? Anyone else that has questions? There are uh, mics at the back, so just head up and... No one? This is the tool. I didn't put the name on the slide. I just wanted to, to wrap up that last slide there. This is GitHub Ghost. It's just been open sourced and it's already got you know that many uh, stars. And this is, this is Ghost. So that was that, just to wrap up, all right? And I'll, I'll tweet the slides so you can get all the reference and all the materials, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Now um, let's invite up our next speaker, Timothy Chandler.